lot of good conversations this week. Had a lot of good uh, uh, times with, with some of you. And, um, but uh, one, of, one of the conversations I had with somebody, a friend who came into the office, said, before we jump into things, I, I just got to ask you something. Um, in light of all the bad stuff in your life, and in light of the stuff you've gone through and that you're still going through, and probably, as I get to know you, you're probably going to keep going through, how do you still have any faith in God? I, I thought that's actually a pretty good question. And um, I didn't have a quick answer. Um, I, and then I thought about it, and I, I said, you know, I think it's because um, along the way, um, because of my relationship with, with uh, Christ, and I've gotten to know God a little bit, I've never thought that it was God doing these things to me. It, that never crossed my mind. Now, I know that people screw you over and all that, you know, but God never did. And I thought, wow, that's a miracle that, um, that, that I uh, just never saw God in that light. And um, as we go towards Easter, this is the first week of Lent, which is a season of preparation uh, for um, celebration of Easter. And um, I want to continue a little bit of what we've been doing in Matthew 6. And we're going to look at the different parts of the Lord's Prayer because I think how mm -hmm. Jesus teaches us to pray and enables us to pray um, will shape it'll shape our relationship with God and help us to look at our lives in certain ways maybe in different ways uh, and and we change as people as well as Jesus teaches us to pray so uh, you, you've heard these verses before but Matthew chapter 6 um, beginning in verse 7 when you pray do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's pray. Lord, your name is holy. You are our Father in heaven, and teach us what that means. Teach us how we might... Uh, come to you and, and discover a relationship that has integrity and um, love in the center of it and intimacy. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, teach us to pray and in so doing, teach us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, uh, I, I've been saying the Lord's Prayer, you know, maybe it's just because I'm a pastor, but I've been saying this like, seems like my whole life and we we pray it in the services uh, every Sunday um, and it's uh, it's been a part of my life and then I realized that sometimes it just exists there but um, what difference does it make and so I want us to look at this and discover the difference and I need my notes to do this so here we go um, all prayer is is a conversation with God, right? Just a, a simple and yet profound conversation. Two way, right? And how we approach that makes a big difference. Now, when, when we hear something like, uh, here's how you ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Uh, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I... And yet, we as people tend, or, or I'll just take this on myself, I tend yeah. to complicate things and make it much more difficult than it, than it ought to be. But I found out that I'm not alone in this. I discovered um, Edward Harwood. You probably aren't familiar with him. He was a theologian, and in 1768, he published a book. And I thought, great. This was the title, A Liberal Translation of the New Testament Being an Attempt to Translate the Sacred Writings with the Same Freedom and Spirit and Elegance with Which Other English Translations from the Greek Classics Have Lately Been Executed. 
<laughs> Try buying the bat on Amazon. <laughs> you start with execution, and then you work, you work backwards. So I was interested in uh, this very nice uh, freeing uh, translation. And so when you look up Matthew 6 and see how it's translated, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? This is how we translate it. O thou great governor and parent of universal nature, who manifested thy glory to the blessed inhabitants of heaven, may all thy rational creatures and all the parts of thy boundless dominion be happy in the knowledge of thy existence and providence and celebrate thy perfections in a manner most worthy thy nature and perfective of their own. <laughs> you know, that really clarifies. <laughs> Like nothing, <laughs> like nothing we've ever seen. And I, but I think about that, I go, isn't that really what we do in our own ways? We, we take uh, the, the clear, um, helpful, meaningful uh, words from, from Scripture, and then when we go to apply them, it gets kind of complicated and murky, and then pretty soon it, it expands to the point where it's meaningless now. And so I want us to go back reverse that process and go back uh, very simply and specifically and look at what it is that Jesus is, is teaching us to do when he teaches us to pray. Right? Now, this seems simple enough, but um, I've told you before, renewal is not discovering new things. Renewal is going back to the beginning, back to the start. And so that's what we're going to do in Lord's Prayer. We're going to discover renewing as we go back to what Jesus had in mind for us. Now, um, when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, holy is thy name. When we say this, one of the most important things in here is that we're saying, God, you're different than me. You are not me. I am not God. When we pray, you know, now, you know, I, I grew up in Southern California and then lived many years in the Bay Area and actually Seattle's part of it. You know, there's kind of that whole new age thing that goes out and, and, and it is <laughs> grounded on the principle that basically each one of us is, is God in our own way and we need to, you know, just release the God within that, that we each uniquely have. And um, so when you pray, basically you're praying to yourself. Jesus is saying, don't pray to yourself. First of all, you're probably uh, not the, the one to do it. <laughs> and uh, secondly, yourself is not going to help you much. But um, when you pray, realize that God is different than you. Is, is um, our Father, our Him, not, oh Lord, within me. And, um, and this becomes uh, really important because holy I want to look at this word. Holy means um, set apart. So, in the, for example, in the Ten Commandments, it says, uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Right? What does that mean? To keep it apart from the other days of the week. To see it as essentially different from every other day. Right? And then, uh, looking up the uh, the... Greek words and the Hebrew words in this, there's another kind of a small way of looking at it, and I just love this. It's, it means to cut. Isn't that weird? And so I started thinking, what does that mean to cut? Well, um, if you ever watch that nature channel where the real violent stuff, you know, that when they cut the herd, they separate one off. It's a separation so that it's different. And, and, and then we talk about Oh, uh, you know, if somebody's really good, they're a cut above the rest. Do we use that phrase? It, it's, a, it's a delineating uh, line. And uh, for you golfers out there, which, are there golfers here? No one that would admit it now. <laughs> and uh, the golfers, they, if you ever watch the, the, like a religious thing, like the Masters, you know, uh, if you ever watch that, um, they have a thing called the cut. And, uh, the, all the professional players who are all very good and all very qualified, they play the first two days and then there's a cut. 
and only those who make the cut go on and play on the weekend and end up getting paid. Everybody else is a volunteer. And, uh, and so uh, there, it's a line of delineation that says these are different than those. And, uh, and I think that that's some of the meaning that we have here for when we say uh, holy is your name, that, that, that you are different from us and you are uh, a cut above. You've made the cut, and we have, and we all these different things that make it seem like um, we recognize our difference from God. We recognize that we're not the holy ones. Now, actually, if you think about this now, this little part that Jesus tells us to do, he said, when you pray, pray this, our Father is in heaven, holy is your name. When you pray that, that actually becomes for us a prayer of confession. Isn't that interesting? A prayer of confession, like we did in the worship time today. It's a confession that says, Lord, you are different from me. You are holy. I'm not. So it becomes, as we enter into this communication, we enter into this relationship, Jesus says, when you pray, acknowledge that you're not holy. And in doing that, it opens the door for us to, to engage in a relationship with the one who is holy. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I've searched and searched in the Bible. I haven't been able to find it yet where Jesus says, when you pray, pray, Lord, make me holy. You know, i got to confess, you know, that's off and on. That's been my prayer. Usually I think on my better days I'm praying that. You know, Lord, make me holy. Make me, oh, make me different. Make me a cut above. Make me, oh, then I can pray to myself. See, that's why he doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't say, when you pray, pray, Lord, make me holy. He says, acknowledge our Heavenly Father is different. And, and he alone is holy. And then in, in acknowledging that, it, we come to grips with ourselves. And, um, you know, one of the great passages in the Bible, let me, I'm going to be juggling stuff today. I hope that's all right with y'all. Um, if it's not, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to be juggling stuff. So uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, and... Uh, Verse 3, they were calling to one another, Holy, 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 we sang that today, is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the um, <laughs> doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Get this. Woe to me. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. See, I think that's the beginning of the relationship. When we, when we see the Lord high and lifted up and realize, woe to me, I'm not high and lifted up. I'm unclean and all my friends are too. I go to a church of unclean people. That's the beginning. Because then God can do something with us because at that point, we're now approaching this relationship, we're approaching this conversation, we're approaching this prayer, seeing reality. That's basically it. This, this opening uh, part of the Lord's Prayer is an opportunity for us to see reality. And it's so very important. Now, there's power in the name. We know that. Jesus knew that, right? Uh, he often change people's names when they follow them, you know. Um, we all had names when we were kids. Uh, some we like, some we don't. Um, Jake shared uh, with us, I think, that uh, uh, he changed his name. He wasn't born Jake, you know. He changed it uh, because that was the name his father called him. And he said, I don't, I don't want to hear that anymore. So he became Jake. Um, uh, I had names, you know, <laughs> deeply troubled. <laughs> uh, 
That's kind of a middle name too, isn't it? <laughs> Deeply troubled, let's call it. Uh, problem with his mouth. Um, uh, the wild one, you know. Um, uh, spiritually immature. I, I've, I had a bunch of names, you know. And you might have had names too, you know. Maybe you were, you were Lumpy or you were um, <laughs> the dumb one or the smart one or the pretty one or the other one, whatever it was, you know. And, and, and the way people talked to us and the way they approached us had a lot of power in terms of shaping how we behaved around them, right? And, and, uh, that's why there's so much power. When someone affirms you and calls out things about you that uh, you haven't heard in a long time, you kind of take notice of it and you sit up and you go, oh, wow, thanks for noticing that. I hadn't heard that in a while, you know? And there's a real power in that affirmation. Now, Jesus understands there's power in the name. And, and so when we look at um, how we call upon the Lord, Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Your name is set apart. And uh, and we hear, you know, in the Ten Commandments again, uh, you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Right? Is that one of them? Did I get that right? Okay. You know, most of my life I thought that was you're not supposed to cuss. I, I, I thought that. Anybody else join me in that? Okay. See, I thought so too. And... Uh, and then I, I took up playing golf, which, you know, that changes everything. <laughs> and uh, I, I learned, uh, you know, my dad was in the Navy in and, and World War II, and so, you know, they always had that, you know, you cuss like a sailor. And so, you know, we had certain skills in our home. But when I started playing golf with a group of pagan golfers, their level of swearing was so far beyond anything I'd heard. They were like savants. Of layering insult, slander, uh, hatred in a, the most hysterically funny way, you know. And I remember once I was playing down, it was near Pebble Beach, it wasn't Pebble Beach, but I was playing down there one day, and the big team yelled at people, you know. And this guy, he had this habit of letting go of this string of obscenity that you, you marvel at how it all links together, you know? And, and then he would say, you're not a reverend, are you? And then he'd go on, you know, not even waiting for an answer. And, and the guy I was playing with uh, from church kept saying, should we tell him? <laughs> no, 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 that'll throw him off, you know? And, and, and finally, we're on the 18th hole, that's the last one, we're on the green, and we're putting, and he misses his putt, and he lets out with a, a super stream, you know? It was glorious, really. It, I, I was struck by the splendor of his words and how he strung them together. And then he turned to me, well, at least you're not a reverend, are you? And I went, yes, I am. <laughs> the book on his head. <laughs> and, and without a word, he turned and walked off the course. <laughs> it was like, wow. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> But, you know, but I, so I thought, you know, okay, uh, don't take the name of the Lord in vain means don't cuss. I think it's more than that. I think it goes so far beyond that. I think that when we don't acknowledge the holiness of God and his involvement and engagement in our daily life, we take his name in vain. When we call ourselves Christian, little Christ, and, and, and we don't share a, a positive uh, witness with the people around us about how they can have a relationship with God too. Uh, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. When we don't invite the Lord into every part of our life, our money, our sex, our work, our play, our family, everything, when we keep him at a distance, we take his name in vain. Okay? So you may think, well, I'm not cussing like those golfers. Well, so what? because there's so much more to it. How do we invite God into our lives and, and say, Lord, you are holy, and I want a relationship with you, though I don't deserve it. See, that's a free thing, and, and, uh, and we do not take it in vain then. Now, Jesus starts this prayer um, Chapter 6, you know, the, the context of it is, uh, don't be like those pagans 
for your father knows what you need before you ask him. That's his words just before he says, this is how you ought to pray. Your father knows your needs before you ask. Therefore say, our father in heaven, holy is your name. We say that because the father already knows your needs before you ask. See? That's really, really important. We're not surprising God and shocking him with our prayer. We're not saying, well, Lord, you know, we've got these needs here. No, really? I had no idea. I guess I was busy with the troubled folk, and I missed you. Yes, the God's not like that. It's like, yeah, I know. I'm glad you finally recognize it. I think that's what he says to me. It's about time, West Paul, you got what I've known all along, right? But he knows your needs. Now, I don't know why it is, but the temptation in my life has always been to try and keep God posted on what he may have forgotten about. That's basically been my approach to prayer and everything else. You know, Lord, you probably tuned out here, so let me remind you of what you should be focusing on. And I'm one who has no focus. And, and yet I'm trying to, you know, give God spiritual uh, rhythm. Now, uh, there's a theologian back <coughs> on the 50s uh, uh, named Helmut Tillich. And uh, uh, he had an insight about this that had to do with, um, uh, he compared it to a medical thing. So this is what he said. When a person comes to a doctor with all kinds of fears and anxieties, they do so because they don't really know what they're afraid of. That's why they go to the doctor. There's something vague and undefined within them, and that's precisely why he's so uncomfortable. And the doctor must first bring out what it is. So it is with our prayers to God. Often we ourselves do not know our deepest needs and certainly we don't know what remedies we need. We often pray for foolish things when what we need is something totally different. We're naked. Instead of praying for clothing, we pray for bonbons. I guess those were big in the 50s, I guess. We were, are imprisoned by certain passions, perhaps slaves of our vanity and our urges. Instead of freedom, we pray for a Persian rug for ourselves. So often, he writes, we pray for senseless things that have no relation to our needs. And the reason is, we do not know the deepest wants and necessities of our life at all. That's why Jesus said, the Father knows your needs before you ask. We have no idea. So all of our efforts to be eloquent in prayer often miss the point. Because we don't really know what to ask for. And that's why Jesus said, before you even utter a prayer, the Lord already knows your heart, knows your life, knows your need, knows your situation, and, and, uh, and wants to be engaged in that. Now, I'm sorry, I'm really moving you guys through the Bible today. I hope this isn't too aerobic for you. Um, <laughs> turning pages like this. Hebrews chapter 11 has another very uh, familiar passage. I'm talking about faith. And uh, Hebrews 11 verse 6, I think it is. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Anyone who would come to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now think about that. As we come to God in prayer, Jesus says, you know, I'll teach you how to pray. You don't have to go on babbling like the pagans, you know. You don't have to put on a show. God knows your needs. This is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Now, I was asked, after everything you've been through and everything you're going through and everything you're probably going to go through, 
How do you still have faith in God? It's because I know the Father who's in heaven who is different than me and who's different from everyone else I know. And I believe that he rewards those that seek him and I believe that he's there. Now, do I know everything about God? Am I like some brilliant uh, theologian who's going to give you a discourse? On, no, probably not. I know very little about myself or about you all. But... I make a choice, I choose, day by day or minute by minute, I'm going to believe God now, and I'm going to believe that he uh, wants to bless me now, or bless you. And that's the context for the prayer. Now, I want to give you a homework assignment, of course, because we're left, you know, and so this is where you really have to do a lot of work, right? This is where we get really religious. So here's the homework assignment. Between now and Easter... And as we go through this uh, prayer that Jesus teaches us how to pray, I want you to, to uh, sit down and have a conversation with God. Um, you don't have to do it every day, because I know then you won't do it. So do it like five days a week, five out of seven. That gives you two days off. You have your choosing, right? So I'm not too tough on you. And, uh, and you never have to do this after Easter. Okay, this is just for now. Um, I want you to do this experiment in which you choose to believe in God, believe that he exists, and you choose to believe he wants to reward those who seek him. Now, you may say, well, I'm kind of on the pagan side here, you know. <laughs> I'm not like all these good Christians at Harvard Church. I'm, uh, you know... And I go, it doesn't matter, same assignment. Go, well, I don't even know if God exists. I know, right? same assignment. You choose for this experiment to believe that God exists. So as much as you can understand about who God is and yourself and everything, you make the conscious choice. I'm going to believe he exists. I just take John's word for it. And I'm going to believe that he wants to reward those who seek him. And then begin your conversation. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. You're different than me. And let that conversation move forward. You don't have to have a big faith. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have everything figured out. You don't have to have your life in order. You don't have to uh, even know what the issues are that keep your life screwed up. God does. He knows it. And, and he's, he's so not afraid of you. That's the, the key thing. He is so not afraid of your issues. He is so not afraid of whether or not you've got all your questions answered. Or if your belief is, your faith is uh, rock solid. He doesn't care. Here's what it says. We believe that he exists. And we believe that he wants to reward those who seek. That's how our faith grows. That's how our faith takes root. And, and the Heavenly Father, who's holy and different from us and, and uh, longing for a loving, intimate relationship with us, will enter into every part of our life. We have no secrets to conceal. And we say, Lord, have your way in me. Have your way in me. <laughs> So that's your assignment for this uh, Lenten season. I hope you'll do it uh, because you will be graded. <laughs> well, I'm not really going to grade it. <laughs> Dave, I, well, maybe I will. Yeah, okay, I should. Uh, now, so next week we're going to look at the next part of this and we're going to go each week through and see how free our life can be as we take Jesus at his word and do what he says. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and care and that you do invite us into your presence. You, in, you invite us into a relationship. You long to be engaged with us. And so, Lord, as an act of faith, we say today, we believe you exist 
and we choose to believe that you reward those who seek you and Lord we're seeking you so draw near to us and transform us by your grace Amen